Uh, okay, um, welcome everyone to the second Digital Europe Economic Seminar. Um, so today's seminar, Dr. Anna Kerkhoff of IFO Institute for Economic Research is going to present uh, her work on advertising and content differ differentiation. Um, and um, well, the, uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at introductions, sorry. Um, but uh, thank you for coming here and please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for having me. And let me just mention, so in case you have um, any questions or comments, please just interrupt me. So just unmute yourself and um, say whatever you want to say, because uh, I might not see it if you raise your hands or uh, use the chat. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about advertising and content differentiation on YouTube. And um, I think you would all agree here that media consumption is a very important part of our everyday lives. So, for example, the average adult in the US and also in Europe spends several hours per day consuming any kind of media content, including um, traditional media like television and radio, but also, of course, all the online media that you can find nowadays, like social media, online newspapers and so on and so forth. However, while we are kind of similar in the quantity of media consumption, uh, we also know that preferences over media content differ substantially between different groups of consumers. So, for example, men prefer very different media content than women and young prefer different content than old and so on and so forth. So what we would ideally have is a media landscape that is very differentiated, so horizontally differentiated in terms of um, content that is available, such that everybody gets um, his or her preferred um, media content to maximize um, surplus. However, it might match your own perception or not. Many scholars and many politicians also argue that um, media uh, do not differentiate a lot. and in fact, that there's a lot of duplication of, of mainstream content going on, uh, which would not be um, efficient from an economic, economic point of view. But when you want to talk about content differentiation or content duplication in media markets, you always have to take into account um, the specific business model of uh, media outlets, which is that most media outlets are financed all or in part by advertising revenue and that induces you know additional incentives regarding on um, content choice and well there's in fact two opposing arguments so one group of scholars says that advertising in media markets leads to duplication of mainstream content and this is because um, the media outlets when incentivized by advertising revenue care about maximizing their audience size to sell as many eyeballs as possible to the advertisers and gain as much advertising revenue as, as possible. However, scholars have also realized that advertising is a nuisance to us consumers. So we do not like advertising. We perceive it as a nuisance and disturbance if, for example, we're watching a YouTube video and are interrupted by um, an ad. Um, in other words, advertising is perceived similar to a price by consumers. And if you take this into account, you could also come up with the opposite argument, namely that advertising could lead to content differentiation because once the media outlets enter you know, competition with other outlets, um, they rather differentiate from each other move into a niche to gain some market power to be able to raise their prices or like advertising quantity in this case. Now, the big question is, does advertising now lead to content duplication or content differentiation in media markets? Um, this question is unresolved so far in uh, the theoretical literature, and there's also hardly any empirical investigations on this question, which is mainly due to the fact that um, advertising is an endogenous choice of, of the media outlets, and therefore it is um, 
difficult to estimate causal effects. And this is where my paper comes in. So I study the effect of an exogenous increase in the technically feasible advertising quantity on the individual content choices of several thousand YouTubers. And I exploit two features of YouTube's monetization policy to identify a causal effect, combining difference in difference and IB techniques. And the main results are as follows. So I find that advertising actually leads to an increase in content differentiation. And I will also show you that a likely economic mechanism that drives this result is that the YouTubers want to reduce competition to other YouTubers. So as far as I know, uh, this paper is the first to find empirical evidence of a positive effect of advertising on content differentiation, which I think is an important insight given that many media outlets options to generate app revenue are subject to external regulation and this additional channel that I'm going to present today should be taken into account. Okay, so um, this relates to a couple of uh, strands of literature. So first, um, it, it is related to the literature on horizontal product differentiation, and more specifically to content choice in media markets, which is product uh, differentiation and product choice in media markets. Um, it is also linked to the digitization of media markets literature and to the literature on um, user generated content. Okay, so let's go into the details. So I guess everybody here knows YouTube, so I don't have to um, tell, much, uh, tell you much about YouTube. So it's a video sharing platform based on user-generated content and it is huge. So YouTube has an enormous reach. It um, is the second most popular website in the world, only after google.com. And um, just think about what that means. So, but in addition to being, um, you know, interesting and huge and relevant in itself, um, it is particularly suited for my purposes because the YouTubers can generate ad revenue by permitting YouTube to show ads to viewers before or during their videos. And this works as follows. So imagine you are a YouTuber and you want to generate ad revenue. Then you can take a video of yours and tell YouTube, well, at this point in time in, in my video, I allow you to show an ad to my viewers. And then it is up to YouTube's algorithm to decide which particular ad is shown to a particular viewer and if that particular viewer is shown an ad at all. So YouTube's algorithm does the matching between particular ad and particular viewer. The YouTubers have no say in that. And the algorithm may also decide that, you know, the viewer has seen 10 ads in the last 10 minutes, so the viewer is going to be spared. Um, and I'm, you know, stressing this um, to, uh, to um, well, I, I just want to stress that there is no direct connection between advertisers and YouTubers. In addition to that, there is a um, very particular feature on YouTube that I would like to illustrate using this example. So this is a screenshot by the channel of Dougie B. So she's a very successful and large German YouTuber. She has nearly 4 million subscribers. And I would like you to pay attention to her video's duration. So I hope you can see that on your screens at home. So here in the lower right corners, you can see the video durations. <laughs> and what you might notice is that nearly all of the videos are somehow between 10 and 14 minutes long. And there's a reason for that. So this is a video that is um, very short. It's just four minutes something. And what you can see here is one yellow dot. And this yellow dot um, indicates an ad break. So in this four minutes video is one ad break. This is a video that is just over 10 minutes long. And what you can see here in this video are five yellow dots. And there was actually a sixth one that um, I had to watch to make the screenshots. So in this video are six ad breaks. And this is what is called the 10 minutes trick. 
So the 10 minutes trick on YouTube refers to a discontinuity in the mapping from a video's duration to the technically feasible number of outbreaks that the video can carry. In particular, if the video is shorter than 10 minutes, you can allow for at least for at most one outbreak in your video. But as soon as your video is 10 minutes or longer, you can in principle have as many outbreaks as you want. Now, this 10 minutes trick um, has existed for quite some time, but long ago it was a hidden feature. This changed, however, in October 2015, when YouTube made, uh, launched a new ad break tool, which um, had two effects. So first, it made the 10 minutes trick much more obvious to the YouTubers. And second, it also facilitated um, adding addi additional ad breaks. So on the left hand side here, you can see the old tool. And on the right hand side is the new tool. So what you can see here in the old tool is um, when you had a video that was longer than 10 minutes, this additional input box here would appear. You had to tick it and then point, uh, type the exact point in time in your video where you wanted additional outbreaks to appear. In the new version, you can see those additional ads um, default wise and you can edit them if your video is 10 minutes or longer. And you also get a preview of the exact point um, in your video where um, the ad break is going to be shown to make it, for example, um, the least annoying to, to your audience. Okay, so having introduced the, uh, the 10 minutes trick and the launch of the new ad break tool, I can illustrate my identification strategy to you. So this is a stylized example. So please consider three different YouTubers, A, B, and C, in a world before October 2015, where this 10 minutes trick was not well known yet. And um, so YouTubers A, uh, so on the x-axis you have um, video duration and on the y-axis you have the technically feasible number of, of ad breaks. So here A's videos are very short, say two minutes. B's videos are longer, like eight minutes. And C's videos are longer than 10 minutes. So C benefits from this discontinuity in the mapping from video duration to advertising quantity. Okay. <clears throat> So I argue that before October 2015, and I'm also going to show some evidence in a few slides, that YouTubers like A and B are very likely to be unaware of the 10 minutes trick um, because the feature was not well known yet. So the location here on the line, so the typical um, video duration is um, a result of their preferences, their style, but not a strategic choice regarding, you know, the distance to, to this 10 minutes threshold. C, in contrast, might have come across already before October 2015, um, so across the 10 minutes trick. So C may already know. Now, it's October 2015, and A and B learn that they can earn more money by having more ad breaks by producing videos that are longer than 10 minutes. Now, C might have known already, but A and B might want to benefit from the 10 minutes trick now. However, B is already so much closer to the 10 minute threshold than A. Um, so B will have a much easier time to bring her videos across the 10 minute threshold than A. So what I'm going to do is the following. So I will also only consider YouTubers like A and B and compare the change in content of YouTubers who produced longer videos after October 2015 to those who didn't and to account for the endogenous selection into this treatment, I use the closeness to the 10 minute threshold from before October 2015 as an instrument for the treatment status. So I combine diff and diff with IV. 
which of course I'm going to, to show you in detail, but just to give you an idea of what I'm doing. Okay, so to carry out this analysis, I need a lot of data. Um, I obtained this data via the YouTube data API and also um, via HTML web scraping. So the data API gives me nearly everything that I need. Um, so I obtain data um, on the YouTuber level of the entire population of active YouTube channels as of October 2017. And I get, you know, the number of subscribers, the video duration, date of upload, genre, likes, dislikes, and so on and so forth. What I can't get is um, the monetization settings, meaning the number of ad breaks per video and if there are ad breaks, which is very unfortunate because this is central to my analysis. So to get this information, I, um, I wrote a web scraper. And in particular, I remembered that, oh, that's the only direction, um, that you can see ad breaks as yellow dots in the videos. So I wrote a program that can go through all the videos in my data set and look for yellow dots in the HTML code. Uh, however, I found out that YouTube is uh, not very fond of web scrapers. And um, to be precise, uh, YouTube does not want any automated data collection that collects data faster than a human could. So it let my scraper crash all the time. Um, as a compromise, um, I, well, I had to make my scraper very slow, as slow as a human, but that meant that I couldn't go through all the videos in my data set anymore. It would have taken like three years or so. As a compromise, um, I let my web scraper pick 20 randomly drawn videos per YouTuber. And if it detects at least one ad break in these 20 videos, I classify the YouTuber as advertising YouTuber and as non-advertising YouTuber otherwise, such that I have the information at least on um, the YouTuber level, if not on, uh, on the video level. Um, my main dependent variable is going to be an indicator for mainstream content. And I generate this indicator based on the keywords that YouTubers assign to their videos. And these keywords make the video searchable via the search engine. So for example, a funny cat video with a funny cat, ball, mouse, pet, whatever. So for each month, for each video genre, I compute how many views a certain keyword has attracted, rank them in descending order, and I classify the upper 1% of this distribution as mainstream keywords. I have a couple of robustness checks on this arbitrary choice, so don't worry. Then having those mainstream keywords, I assign a dummy equal to one to all videos equipped with such a mainstream keyword. And to give you an example, so consider March 2015 and the genre science and technology, there are around 13,000 different keywords. The most viewed ones are do-it-yourself, self-made and homemade. And the distribution of views over keywords is very heavily skewed. So those three top keywords attracted um, like nearly 4% of all views. The upper 1% of keywords, so the mainstream keywords, attracted around 45% of all views, whereas the lowest 10% of keywords like hardly attracted any, any attention. Um, into my final data set, I include observations from January 2013 to January 2017. I keep only YouTubers left to this 10 minute threshold, as I said. So YouTubers like A and B in the stylist example, um, where I measure their position on, on this line in terms of their median video duration before October, 2015. Um, such that my final data set includes around 16,000 YouTubers with around 1.4 million videos over a time period of 49 months. Okay, having the data, um, I guess the next step is to convince you that uh, the raw uh, data support the story that I'm telling you. So let's start with the effect of the launch of the new ad break tool in October 2015. 
So if this new app break tool really made the 10 minutes trick more obvious to the YouTubers, what you'd expect to see is that the share of videos just over 10 minutes increases for advertising YouTubers afterwards and remains constant for non-advertising YouTubers. And this is exactly what you can see here. So on the x-axis, you have um, the development over time. And on the y-axis, you have um, the fraction of videos between 10 and 40 minutes, so just over 10 minutes. And this fraction increases for advertising YouTubers after October 2015, while nothing happens for the non-advertising YouTubers. Okay, in the following, I'm going to focus on advertising YouTubers because I think that comparing advertising and non-advertising YouTubers beyond some illustrative, ev uh, illustrative evidence is going to be problematic, given that those two groups are likely to act based on entirely different motives. So in this graph and in the analysis and in everything that follows, it is just advertising YouTubers. Okay, so I announced that YouTubers like B are going to have an easier time to adapt um, to their videos to over 10 minutes than YouTubers like A. Now, this closeness to the 10 minute threshold is a continuous measure, so I can't just compare to distinct groups. To still provide you with some illustrative evidence, I picked some YouTubers around the 25th percentile of closeness and around the 75th percentile of closeness to the 10 minute threshold, so these guys are, are closer. And you can see that the increase in the fraction of videos between 10 and 14 minutes is indeed a little steeper for those guys cl initially closer to the threshold than for those further away. Another way to think about this is in terms of bunching. So these are histograms of video duration of the YouTubers closer to the threshold before and after October 2015. And the red vertical line is um, the 10 minute threshold. And what you can see here is that before October 2015, this distribution is quite smooth around this threshold. While afterwards, you have this um, very you know, evident bunching just, just after the 10 minute threshold. So YouTubers do bring their videos to just over 10 minutes to benefit from um, from, from being able to have additional app breaks. And this is, by the way, also the promised evidence for YouTubers not um, exploiting the 10 minute threshold before the new app break tool was launched. Um, these are the YouTubers you know, further away and not much is happening here, neither before nor after. Okay, so let's come to my empirical strategy in a bit more detail than before. So as I said, I'm going to compare the change in content of YouTubers who increased the video duration to those who didn't in a different diff and then use the closeness as an instrument. But this is on the next slide. So let's have a look at the different diff on this slide. <clears throat> so first I need to define treatment and control groups. So um, I compute the share of videos between 10 and 14 minutes before and after October 2015 for each YouTuber in the sample. And if this share has increased by at least five percentage points, I classify the YouTuber as treated and as untreated otherwise. Again, I have a couple of robustness checks on these arbitrary choices and um, defining treatment and control groups like the otherwise doesn't affect my results. So having that, I can set up my baseline regression equation, <clears throat> which is um, as follows. So on the left-hand side, you have this indicator variable for mainstream content, um, which I explained um, a couple of minutes ago. Then you have the diff and diff interaction term, control variables, so mainly um, controls for video category, YouTuber and time fixed effects, YouTuber specific linear time trend and an error. So this is um, a linear probability model where beta is um, the main um, parameter of interest. And um, you can interpret 
it as the percentage point change in the probability to produce mainstream content for YouTubers who could increase their advertising quantity relative to those who couldn't. Okay, <clears throat> so as announced, um, estimating this baseline diff and diff by OLS is probably a bad idea, given that YouTubers could self-select into this treatment status. <clears throat> now, for example, it is possible that particularly uh, money-loving YouTubers um, just um, self-select into this treatment and produce longer, longer videos and also uh, diff slightly different content. Therefore, I use the closeness to the 10 minute threshold in terms of the median video duration from before October 2015 as an instrument for DI, whereby the approach extends to those two stages, <clears throat> which I then can estimate by two, two stage least squares. And the reduced form of this model would look like this. So you would have the mainstream indicator on the left-hand side and here an interaction between the instrument and um, the post uh, indicator, which I'm showing you because uh, I'm, I'm coming back to that on two slides. So in order for this to work well, um, the instrument must fulfill certain requirements, of course. So first, the instrument must be relevant. Um, in other words, close I must be correlated to DI, which is of course plausible. I have already shown you um, graphic evidence for that. And of course, we can also inspect the first stage results of my regression. And um, as, a, as a spoiler, so the F statistic is going to be larger than 140. So I really do not have to worry about weak instruments here. Second, um, the exclusion restriction must be fulfilled, which means that close I must not be correlated with the dependent variable mainstream. So put differently, the closeness to the 10 minute threshold from before October 2015 must not affect whether or not a certain YouTuber <laughs> produces mainstream content or not. Again, I think this is plausible, but in addition to this argument, um, the panel structure of my data allows me to conduct um, a, further a further validity check by means of an event study. So please have a look at this equation. So this is an augmented reduced form equation. And so you have the mainstream indicator on the left hand side. And what I did here is to interact each monthly dummy from before the treatment with the instrument close eye and each monthly dummy from after the treatment with um, close eye. And if this close eye really has no effect on the dependent variable, except through the treatment status DI, which only came into force after October 2015, then you'd expect these estimates to be yeah, close to zero, not statistically significant, and these estimates to be not equal to zero and statistically significant. Okay. So these are the main results. In the first three columns, you see um, the estimates from um, regressing the diff and diff equation by OLS. And what you can see here is that the estimates are like extremely small and not statistically significant, even though I have um, many observations. However, this changes once I use the two-stage least squares approach. <clears throat> the estimates are now negative and highly statistically significant at the 1% level. And you'd interpret um, these estimates as follows. So <clears throat> the um, probability to duplicate mainstream content decreases by about 20 percentage points for YouTubers who could increase the advertising quantity after October 2015 relative to those who couldn't. Yeah, so um, an increase in, in feasible advertising quantity actually leads to a decrease in the probability to produce mainstream content. And um, well, the first stage results are fine. So um, as I said, the instrument is relevant. 
And also the reduced form results are um, in line with what you can see in columns four to six. So they are smaller, but um, have the same sign and are also um, highly statistically significant. Um, this is the event study. So the blue dots are the estimates from this augmented um, reduced form equation that I have just shown you. And the gray and orange dots are a 95 percentage um, confidence interval. And the main takeaway from this slide is that before October 2015, these estimates you know, fluctuate around zero, are not statistically significant most of the time, whereas afterwards, you know, all estimates are negative, even with a downwards trend. And um, statistics statist statistically significant most of the time. I have a lot of robustness checks on these results, which I'm not going to show you except for the last one, which is in like, in my opinion, the most compelling one, um, which is coming back to the non advertising YouTubers. Because what, if what I'm telling you is true, then you'd expect to see no effect for the non advertising YouTubers. And if I run exactly the same um, regressions on subsample of non-advertising YouTubers, this is exactly what happens. So you can't see anything happening. <clears throat> okay, so let me briefly talk about one likely mechanism driving these results. So in the beginning, I announced that um, the evidence that, that I'm going to show you is consistent with um, competition being one um, likely driver of, of what um, I have shown you so far. So I, ha I have shown you that the option to have more ads during a video um, leads to a decrease in the, the duplication of mainstream content. Now, why, why is this the case? So what I'm going to show you now is that mainstream content, so content that is in high demand by the audience, is also and highly supplied by the YouTubers. So mainstream content is also produced by many, many, many competing YouTubers. And if you as a YouTuber would like to increase the ad quantity, which is you know, similar to setting a higher price to your audience because advertising is a nuisance, then you risk losing your audience to competing YouTubers because your content is easily substitutable. However, when you, you know, decrease your mainstream content and rather produce niche content that is not very, uh, very where you have more market power, this, um, this uh, risk de decreases. Okay, so this uh, just, just as a summary. Okay, so I start this analysis by um, generating an alternative dependent variable, which I call competitive content and this works analogously to mainstream content. So again, for each month, for each video genre, I compute how many times a certain keyword has been used, like as opposed to viewed, so used this time. Rank them in descending order, and I classify the upper 1% of the distribution as competitive, and assign a dummy equal to one to all videos equipped with a competitive keyword, to give you an example again in the same um, genre science and technology, um, the most used keywords are Deutsch, test and review. So these are in fact different from the most viewed keywords. And again, um, you know, the distribution of usages over, um, over keywords is quite skewed. And the correlation between competitive and mainstream content is rather high, so nearly equal to 0.6, which means, as I said, that um, content that is very mainstream is also, you know, produced by many YouTubers. Um, when I use this alternative dependent variable in uh, the regression equations that I have already shown you, I get the following results. So the all S estimates of the diff and diff are again very small, not statistically significant, but the estimates from the two stage least squares are negative and highly statistically significant and in fact very similar to what I've shown you before, which is not a huge surprise given that those two measures are highly correlated. So these 
<clears throat> results would tell you that the probability to produce competitive content also decreases by about 20 percentage points um, if you could increase your advertising quantity after October 2015. Okay, so to further support this argument that um, you know, like the avoidance of competition is, is one mechanism that drives this result, I have a look at um, the audience of, of, a, of a YouTuber, because if, if what I'm telling you is true, you'd expect that the audience of a YouTuber who moves into a niche and gains market power over the content that she produces becomes more stable. You know, there's, there's less fluctuation in the, in the viewership. If, if a YouTuber wants to prevent viewers from switching to, to a competitor. Unfortunately, um, information on the viewers is not really available on YouTube, but I scraped all the comments, including the commentators' nicknames from underneath the videos. So I used the commentators and the commentators' nicknames as a proxy for the viewers. And given that, I um, compute, a, I generate a measure for, for commentator fluctuation, which is the number of unique commentators over the number of comments. So imagine that um, each single comment underneath your videos is written by, you know, a different commentator. Then this would be equal to one. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, this, this would be like the maximum. If, however, it is the same commentators again and again who comment uh, onto your videos, this uh, measure decreases and becomes smaller than one, which, which, which would I um, interpret as the, the fluctuation becoming less and the commentatorship becoming more stable. The change in commentator fluctuation is then the difference between this measure computed on the videos after the treatment and the fluctuation computed based on all videos for a given YouTuber before the treatment. Well, to check if this, um, this fluctuation really decreases for YouTubers who are treated, I estimate you know, the following uh, regression equation. It looks a bit different because it's not um, a panel anymore. It's, it's just a cross section. And yes, so you have here this difference in fluctuation for YouTuber I on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, the treatment dummy. But again, I use the closeness to the 10 million threshold from before October, 2015 as an instrument for the treatment status. I estimate those two equations by two stage least squares. And if um, the, the, commentators, uh, the commentatorship really became more stable after October 2015 for treated YouTubers, I would expect this, the estimate for raw to be negative. And this is exactly what happens. So uh, even for the OLS, but also for the two stage least squares estimation, this raw is negative, meaning that they are like a given number of comments is writ are written by uh, fewer commentators than, than before. Okay, how, how much more time do I have? I think five, seven minutes or something like that, if we want to keep to this. Uh... Okay. Um, I think I'll skip this and talk briefly about quality. So of course you could ask, yeah, you could wonder how the quality of the videos are affected. So, so far we only talked about content and not about quality. And again, it is possible um, to come up with two opposing arguments. So first, um, you could think that um, once you differentiate from your competitors, you do not just soften price competition, but also quality competition, meaning that quality goes down. However, in this case, um, when you have more ads than before, each single viewer is also more valuable than before. So um, you could also have an incentive to increase the quality of your videos to, um, to keep your viewers watching. 
Um, so measuring quality is of course not so easy. Um, it's probably also um, a very subjective uh, measure. So what I did um, was to use the number of likes and dislikes um, as, as, as a measure of, of quality. So in particular, I used the number of likes over the sum of likes and dislikes, so the fraction of positive ratings of a video as a, um, as an, as a measure of its quality. Um, the advantage of this measure is that it is very straightforward to, to implement because these, um, the, these metrics are easily available. However, it is kind of a net measure of quality and viewers ad aversion because you know, viewers hate advertising and it is possible that they simply put a dislike or do not like a video just because there's three ads. So the quality of the video could in fact improve but still, because the viewers hate ads, they, they give a dislike um, to, to express their ad aversion. And so you, you have to take this into account when you interpret your results. Uh, yeah, that's, that's some evidence for ad aversion. I'm, I'm sorry it's German, but um, you know, the angry smiley and the crying smiley clearly indicate that viewers hate ads. Um, and in fact, I find that the fraction of positive ratings decreases by um, about four percentage points um, for the YouTubers who could increase their advertising quantity, which um, may indicate that the quality went down, but which may also indicate that viewers are just, um, you know, kind of pissed by, by the ads. Okay, so let me conclude in time. Um, this paper that, that I've presented to you studies the link between advertising uh, and content choice. I find that an exogenous increase in the technically feasible advertising quantity decreases the YouTuber's probability to duplicate mainstream content. And one likely economic mechanism that is consistent with the data also <coughs> um, is that YouTubers do this to avoid competition to other YouTubers in this ad price, so the ad quantity. Um, of course, like my paper has a couple of uh, limitations, which also point uh, into like are some directions for future research. So of course, um, other economic mechanisms may exist. I cannot exclude that. Um, so for example, it could be that YouTubers not only avoid competition and um, want to acquire a more, more stable audience, but that you know, viewers in that, that like niche content are also different in their characteristics from the viewers who watch mainstream content. So for example, it is possible um, that they are less adverse, that they value your content more and that you are therefore able to um, increase the ad quantity per video. Also, um, at this point, I'm not able to provide you with um, you know, a sophisticated welfare analysis because I have no measure for the viewers at a version. So um, viewers definitely benefit from, you know, a better supply of niche content. Um, but at the same time, um, they have to endure like more ad breaks. And as long as I do not know which effect overweights, I cannot say whether consumer surplus actually increases or decreases. So I'm quite confident that producer surplus does not decrease and may even increase, but um, I cannot say much about the consumer surplus. Um, also, this is not a story about um, targeted advertising. So as I said in the beginning, there's no direct connection between um, the YouTubers and the advertisers. And as far as I know, the um, revenue that the YouTubers get per ad does not depend on how well YouTube can target um, an ad to a particular viewer. So like this, this is somehow an advantage for my context because this doesn't uh, confound my results. On the other hand, I cannot address any questions related to targeted advertising. And finally, um, I also cannot say anything about what I summarize as commercial media bias. So say um, content altered because of product placement. 
um, because uh, I cannot measure, like I, I do not have a direct measure of video content and I do not know if there is product placement in a, in a given video. However, I think that this is a minor concern because, um, you know, to, to be able to do product placement, you need, you know, a contractual basis between a YouTuber and an advertiser. And in order to have that as a YouTuber, you need to have um, a considerable audience size and only the superstar YouTubers um, are going to have this and are going to, to be able to do product placement. And these superstar YouTubers are also likely to have been aware of the 10 minutes trick even before October 2015. So these are not considered in, in the sample in, in my analysis. Um, so um, I, I do not think that um, product placement is, is a major confounder in my analysis. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. That was it. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to take uh, further questions. Uh, thank you very much. This was a very great presentation. Uh, so does anyone have uh, questions? If so, please do just unmute uh, yourself and go ahead. Uh, is your work uh, available uh, online? Um, yes. Um, so it is on, on my homepage. You know, I, I needed to have a homepage because I was in the job market. Uh, so uh, if, if you Google my name, you're going to find my homepage and there's also the paper. I think it's also available as a, it says E4 working paper. So um, yeah, you, you'll definitely find it somewhere. And if not, you can also write me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you if you want to have it. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the regressions. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, I might have missed it. Um, did you choose, um, assume the normal observation? You did not assume a wrong normal observation for the regressions? Like not normal observations? In the normal distribution. Um, yeah, I think so. Normal and not, you assumed they were normal. I, I don't think, I think I, I was kind of agnostic about this, so. Uh... I, I asked because when I was looking at the distributions, you've seen it appeared to be log normal. Uh, you mean the, the distributions regard like these? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, but these are, um, you know, tiny subsamples. Um, so these are just, you know, illustrative. Uh, so this is some illustrative evidence where I pick some YouTubers around the 70th, 75th percentile in terms of closeness and around the 25th percentile in terms of closeness. So this is not the entire sample. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, can I ask an unrelated question? Why is it 10 minutes? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, so YouTube is um, very intransparent about this. Um, so my, my guess is that um, they wanted to have a very simple rule um, that you know the the youtubers could could understand and they somehow decided oh it's going to be the 10 minute threshold so of course like a staggered um rule uh, would would have made more sense somehow so like have one net break per three minutes video or something like that um but um yeah i they they, they went for the 10 minute threshold i i do not know exactly why i couldn't find out so i tried to contact youtube but of course like i i did this project as a phd student and they completely ignore phd students um so i i guess i i, I need to wait until i am professor and uh then then i'll try to ask again thank you very much
I wanted to ask, um, so is, assuming there's some um, YouTubers who already created videos that were mostly above the 10 minute threshold, do you know if it also affected them in some way in terms of what content they create? Did they change what they were doing before uh, due to the change in the competition, let's say? Or? Um, that's a good question. Um, I haven't considered, um, you know, the YouTubers that were not included into the main analysis yet. So um, I have some, so I skipped this in the presentation for the sake of time. Um, I have computed some aggregate measures where I consider um, the entire um, German market again. So, yeah. So um, I, you know, I, I scraped, you know, the entire population of German uh, of German YouTube channels as of October 2017, and um, I was wondering how, you know, the entire market is is affected. And if you like think of this market in terms of a distribution of, you know, the number of videos over topics. You could frame this question as um, does this tail become longer and does the tail become fat, fatter? Um, and what I find is that the tail does become considerably longer. So um, there's much more different um, <clears throat> unique uh, keywords and topics around afterwards. Like no matter if I consider only the small subsample that I have for the analysis or the entire market. <clears throat> but the tail does not um, become fatter, so it, it remains constant. So I, I compute this um, using a, a Gini coefficient, so as a, as a measure for concentration of a uh, you know, number of videos over topics, and this remains nearly constant. But then if you take into account that the tail also is, is fairly long in, in absolute terms after October 2015, you could interpret this as, um, you know, that those topics who were like sparsely supplied by, by videos before October 2015 are now, you know, better covered somehow, yeah. If, if that answers your question. So this is as, as close as, as I can get at this point. That's great, thank you. Do we have other questions? Maybe I will have a question. Um, yeah, um, so thank you, Anna, for your presentation. It was really nice. Um, I was wondering, uh, probably you said it, probably I just missed it. Why wouldn't you use a regression discontinuity design? Was it because the people self select into the 10 minutes, right? Was, was that the, the major reason for that? Um, yeah, so. Um... I mean, like going for regression discontinuity is what you, you know, find very intuitive, like at, at first sight, of course, like uh, my, my first approach was uh, using um, an RDD. But then, you know, in an RDD, you compare YouTubers, you know, just above the threshold to YouTubers just below the threshold. And um, it, it occurred to me that, that I actually cannot do this because um, you know, it is not random whether YouTubers are here or here mm -hmm. because it's their own choice to move um, like beyond the threshold. So you cannot compare like YouTuber C with YouTuber B for, mm -hmm. for this endogenous selection. So um, like if, if you think in terms of this illustration, I, I rather compare YouTubers who are closer to the threshold with YouTubers who are further away in yeah. that sense. Okay, yeah, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I have another question. Uh, did you detect any kind of uh, like differences uh, between, for example, I don't know, more professional and less professional YouTubers in the sense that, I don't know, maybe between those who create more content and those who create less content <laughs> or any such, uh, you know. Um, yeah, so there is a difference um, in terms of, so there's heterogeneity um, in terms of uh, the number of subscribers. 
So in, in the sample, the median number of subscribers of a YouTuber is around 1000, which in my opinion was surprisingly small because you know when, when we watch YouTube videos, we usually, I think, watch videos by, by YouTubers who have several thousands, if not millions of subscribers. But in fact, you know, this is just the very tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, the, the typical YouTuber has around 1000 um, subscribers. And when I divide the sample at the median number of subscribers into those with fewer and those with more than 1000 subscribers, I find absolutely no effect for the YouTubers who have fewer than 1000 subscribers. And the entire effect comes from the YouTubers who have more than 1000 subscribers, which may be um, because, you know, if, if you do not have like many views and subscribers anyway, then you do not earn much from advertising anyway. So it might not be worth, you know, investing the effort to change, um, you know, the, your videos. Um, this is my interpretation of this result. Also, the, YouTuber, uh, the YouTubers with few subscribers might not care very much. Um, <clears throat> Uh, second, um, I also find heterogeneity um, in terms of um, genre. So I find that, you know, for example, a music video is either three minutes if it's a track or like an hour if it's an album. So you can't easily adjust uh, this, this video duration. And in fact, when I consider only music videos, I do not find any of the effects that I've just shown you but um, they are like present in other categories that are like more easily to, to more flexible in, in terms of time, like people and blogs where people just, you know, talk about their lives, like what, what do you, YouTubers do? Um, yeah. Thank you. Do we have other questions? um yeah, sorry yeah maybe also i missed that <laughs> sorry about that but uh, you showed that actually the different differences out there are not significant right so that's where you then do the iv and i was wondering um maybe i missed it but what, what was the major reason for that because i think that um so i think that this d this di is certainly endogenous mm -hmm. right um because um you know, this di is equal to one if YouTuber i increased um, her share of, of videos just over 10 minutes by at least five percentage points. Yeah. And this is, um, you know, an endogenous choice by, by a particular YouTuber. And, um, you know, if, if for example, particular like YouTubers who, who become very money loving over time say, um, do this so so adapt their the video duration to be able to earn more money and at the same time adapt also the content of the videos then i would have an omitted variable bias here and that's why i use this closeness as an um, instrument for the treatment status okay mm -hmm. yes thank you for uh, yeah, pointing that out again. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think these were all the questions. I actually uh, have a few more like general, more like asking about your advice since you evidently did like tremendous lot of work with YouTube. Um, and if it's no problem with you, if we could talk perhaps a few minutes, just a few minutes afterwards, and I'd ask you if you think- Yeah, sure. Right. Some ideas are feasible to do with the mm -hmm. YouTube or not. And any questions for for the last minute or okay? If 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 not, then well, thank you everyone very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very great presentation, and I hope to see you well uh, at the next seminar, which will take place in a month. And this time on a somewhat different topic, it will be about cyberbullying. Uh, so I hope we'll, we'll see each other there.